Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Richard and I reflect on the famous declamation of Jesus against the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23. It is commonly assumed that by condemning the hypocrisy of religious teachers, Jesus is endorsing an alternative, ethically correct teacher. In reality, Matthew's beautiful and emotionally explosive woes are a universal description of flaws inescapable and endemic to human preaching and teaching. This raises important questions about the prophetic function of a teacher's sins and how these sins are used in Matthew to expose the self-righteous attitude of disciples. You're listening to the Bible as literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to the 19th episode of the Bible as Literature podcast. Earlier today, Richard and I were talking about Matthew chapter 23. It's a famous chapter. And how this text relates to Paul's argument in Galatians, where he is dealing with the problem of glorying in the materialistic striving of the religious community, but also the problem of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem seeking the praise of men. So Richard, say something about this text. I mean, what are your thoughts about Matthew 23? The thing that just jumps out at you when you read this is there's like this chorus all the way through. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. And it keeps going over and over again. And when he's talking about this, he says this in the very beginning, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do but do not do according to their works for they say and do not do and this is the Matthean hypocrisy they say but don't do they teach but are not interested in following the teaching themselves and it goes on they don't even care to follow the teaching teaching for them is functional not in that it perpetuates the teaching but the teaching is functional for them in that it perpetuates their own glory And so he goes on and says, but all their works they do to be seen by men so that other people will see it. They make their phylacteries broad and large in the borders of their garments. They love the best place at feasts, the best seats at synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, be called by men, rabbi, rabbi. They love to get the praise of human beings. But this is like the teacher who needs the praise of his students. It's not like the student who needs the praise of his teacher. And so they function upside down. And the problem is that it's a lack of humility. This is exactly what Jesus accuses them of, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. They are puffed up in themselves, and they need their students to continue to puff them up. But here's the problem, and this, I think, is the rub. In a contemporary cultural setting, for example, in corporate management, something that we're both familiar with, you'll hear leadership coaches talk about modeling correct behaviors. There's this idea in modern culture that you have to lead by example, that it's what you do that counts, not what you say. I mean, this is a very commonly held point of view in contemporary Western society. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. That, to me, is what's striking. Because when I hear this text, there isn't a priest I know, or a teacher I know, including myself, that in some way, shape, or form doesn't embody the characteristics of the scribes and the Pharisees here. And I'll take it a step further. In a contemporary Western setting, where we feign emasculation, even though I don't think that's the case, there's still a power structure, but where we pretend that we're egalitarian, we create a sense of entitlement in our students and our disciples, and their Pharisaic characteristics reflected in this text are amplified. So it's just interesting to me, what is going on here? Why is Jesus insisting? You know, he's pointing out the obvious that they're hypocrites but yet insisting that you have to do what they say. Exactly. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do, but do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. So what he's saying is do what they teach, 
don't do what they do. And this is, I think, an important distinction. If someone tells you to do the right thing and you don't like them and they've proven themselves unlikable and untrustworthy, but what they say is true and verifiable, you're bound to follow what they teach. It's that simple. If the teaching is correct, you have to do it no matter who the messenger is. Do not be called teachers. For one is your teacher. This is verse 10. The Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Don't but call he, yourself a teacher. But here's the problem. You need teachers. You need fathers. I mean, this is the classic debate among Christian denominations. Is the head of the community called father or pastor or whatever? When functionally, it's the same thing. You stand up to speak. It doesn't matter how many apologies you make you are assuming the role of the Pharisee, the teacher, and once you speak, you're condemned. Whether you are a teacher according to this or not is irrelevant. The point is whether you're a student of the correct teaching. But if you do dare to become a teacher, you have to be one who is pursuing it. You have to be one who does not devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. You are not victimizing the weak. You cannot be victimizing the weak and using a piety to then cover it up. You can't be someone who travels land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. You aren't allowed to go and teach him and then fill him with your false piety and make him twice the son of hell as yourself. And what is twice the son of hell as yourself is someone who goes out as a teacher to seek the favor of human beings. I think to impose something other than the text on human beings, I think this is the rub. Because if you preach what the text says, no matter who you are, you are condemned. There's a false assumption people make that there are right people and there are wrong people. The scriptural assumption is that everyone is wrong. So once you stand up to preach, you're condemned. If you preach from the text, then at least you're not adding insult to injury in terms of your unworthiness. The example I would give is you are a manager and your manager is critical of you because you've fallen short. You're not an adequate manager. Here's a policy though that I'd like to deliver to your team. You're not an adequate manager, but I'd like you to deliver this policy and it is my policy. It has to be delivered clearly exactly as I want you to deliver it because the employees have not been behaving. So I want you to explain to them they need to change their ways. And now, if the manager goes then and says, well, I've not been behaving well, so who am I to tell the employees that they need to follow the policy, he's going to get fired. Well, and by the same token, if the employees then say, oh, the manager, he's always such a hypocrite, we don't need to do what his manager is telling him to do. That makes no sense either, because if the director tells your manager that you're supposed to be doing this, you do it, even if your manager doesn't do it. It doesn't matter. See, I think there's a trap in this text, and I think it's a trap that is especially difficult in an American setting. We often talk about our cultural setting, our historical setting. And the trap is very similar to what we've called in the past the David Nathan paradigm. The text is speaking plainly about the hypocrisy of teachers, scribes and Pharisees in the narrative. But in reality, anyone who gets up to speak, even Jesus, who told us that you shouldn't judge because the one who judges is judged, he himself, by standing up and speaking, was judged. Now, the difference between him and the scribes and the Pharisees is that he was judged unjustly. But every other teacher, the poor whom we'll always have with us who come after Jesus, are also judged, but deservedly so. So I think what happens is that people in an anti-authoritarian culture see Jesus lambast the scribes and the Pharisees, and instead of looking for some place to cower and hide because they understand that they're next, they hear this text as a me against the man text, and it actually produces self-righteousness. I think the text is very wise and is inviting the hearer into that temptation. We have to understand how this text functions. It accuses the student of a different thing than it accuses the teacher of. The student, it accuses of judging the teacher. Yeah, you're too much of a hypocrite. I don't know if I can trust you. What you say is nice, but you're not a very nice person. I'm going to ignore it. Which is as despicable as the sins that are described with respect to the teachers. Right. And here's the problem. The text is condemning the student for judging the teacher whether he's right or not. Then the text goes on and on and on and on and condemns all the bad teachers. The student is not allowed then in the end to see, aha, see those scribes and Pharisees, they're hypocrites. No, 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 you're not allowed to do that. The beginning of the text said, you're not allowed to judge your teacher. 
And if your teacher is a scribe, a Pharisee, a hypocrite, woe to them, not woe to you, unless you don't do what they say. The text is addressing the reality of the human situation, the human condition. The teacher will always fall short. The student will always be self-righteous. So let's get past that and figure out a way to ignore the personality of the teacher and the personality of the student and focus on the instruction. This is an extremely important point because when, for example, clergy or teachers take the stance that's so common in Western culture, who am I to say this? Or I'm not worthy. Or they put on this air of humility. But when you try to pretend that you're something other than the scribes and the Pharisees, it's very dangerous because your hearers will look at the scribes and the Pharisees in the text, and they'll look at the teacher and they'll say, oh, this teacher is not like the scribes and the Pharisees. But once you go down that path, it's actually worse. Because the text is saying, no matter how nice you sound, whether you sit in the back at the banquet, whether you don't get special treatment in the marketplace, you're still a hypocrite. Because as soon as you say, this teacher that teacher, then it's about the teacher. It's not about the teaching. Absolutely. That's what it has to be about. It has to be completely about the teaching. When you say, I'm not worthy, you're changing the reference point from the teaching to yourself. It's very problematic. For example, if you have a certain personality trait or you engage in behaviors that are condemned by the text, if you are assigned to preach the text and you choose not to preach what the text says because you don't feel you have a right to because of your behaviors, you're self-referential. Conversely, and this is the ugly twin sister of this behavior, when someone who has been able to, at least by their measure, not by the measure of the gospel, but by their own standards, have been able to behave correctly in certain ways, they then feel that they have a right to speak with authority on those topics, and they condemn others from, again, a self-righteous fleshly platform. This is self-righteousness. Mm -hmm. In other words, when the teacher speaks and you say, oh, look, he's a Pharisee, He's so self-righteous. Once you say that, you are condemned of self-righteousness. Right, and this is what... This, this is endemic to preaching. This is the way the system works. It's not that this is a symptom or a problem. The whole function of the sermon is to invite the addressee to condemn the preacher and in so doing condemn themselves. Right. This is verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. Right. I very much like that. Oh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they're very good at paying tithe of mint and anise and cumin. That's not a big deal. You know, you, mint is a weed. I mean, you can pluck it and you can offer it. No big deal. Ah, but I did it. That's the thing. W what about justice and mercy and faith? Well, those, you know, I'm still working. Oh, well, well, hold on a second. I'm still working on those. These are the weightier matters. Now, you have to do the mint and the cumin and the anise, but you aren't allowed to leave the other ones undone. And so this is what happens. You say, well, I'm very good at the mint and the cumin. I'm not as good at the other things, but I'm going to talk about how important mint and cumin and anise are because I can now demonstrate how I am on a higher level. Now, some people will go through the gymnastics of saying, I'm not just saying it because I'm putting myself on a higher level. It's because blah, it's blah, important. Blah. It's important to talk about this. But it's not important to talk about this because it says the weightier matters are justice and mercy and faith. And if you're neglecting to talk about those things, you're neglecting to talk about the heart of the matter. Here's the other thing that's critical. The only reason you know that the functional teacher in Matthew is condemned of these things or to be shamed for these things, is because the text is telling you about their behavior and their action and their character. You, as a human being, cannot discern that about your teacher or conversely about your student. You cannot go by appearances because if someone gets up to speak a word of judgment and it's a word of judgment that makes you uncomfortable, your first inclination will be to try to undermine the authority of the judgment that's spoken by criticizing the person speaking it. But on what basis do you criticize them? It's a distraction. Judging on the outside is a distraction. Verse 27, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. You can't judge from the outside. You don't know. That's the key. Because in scripture and in life, you cannot discern, as I wrote recently in a paper, this is what I'm trying to get at, you cannot discern an act of cruelty that appears as kindness from an act of kindness which is manifest as cruelty. You can never know which is in service of the gospel 
or how God himself on that day will judge those deeds. You can only know if what the teacher is saying conforms to what he was instructed to say by the text. So the whole question of personality and style and hypocrisy is a distraction. Mm -hmm. This text functions to keep the preacher under the authority, under the pressure, hypomoni, under the pressure of the gospel. But it also serves to cause the student to stumble so that they would find themselves under the same pressure. And in this way, although there is a power structure in the teacher-disciple relationship, it is one table with one meal served, which is the bread of the gospel. It's interesting that you say that because I was thinking about this. I thought, it's interesting, this whole chapter, it's a long chapter. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, and these are the leaders of the community, again and again and again and again. And I was thinking, well, why is it the case that there's so little said about the student and so much said about the scribes and the Pharisees. Well, that seemed kind of strange to me. But then I started thinking about the prophets. There's so much in the prophets about the kings and the priests and so little about the ordinary people. Why is this? I think that the one who is the king is not the one who is ordained necessarily as the king or ordained as a scribe and a Pharisee, but as one who functions as a king, who functions as a scribe and a Pharisee. And this condemns anyone who would teach their brother, anyone who would take the position functionally, if not in title, functionally of scribe and Pharisee, someone who would have their rule that they like to follow and lord it over somebody else who would claim to be a teacher, but who would neglect the way your matters. Or who would claim to be a student, or a disciple, or a parishioner, and would glory in the flesh of the preacher. I agree with you, because then the student becomes the functional tyrant. The sins of the preacher are a scandalon of the gospel, put there by God as a test for you, to see whether you have ears to hear or not. The sins of the preacher are functionally the right hand of God, just like Babylon is the right hand of God in Ezekiel. In other words, Matthew 23 emasculates all attempts at the me against the man mentality. It emasculates all attempts at authoritarianism. It emasculates all attempts at egalitarianism. Because, as we hear again and again in the prophets, as Dr. King quoted so beautifully, the Lord is coming and the valleys are flattened out because only he stands out. And when the Lord comes in this way, then justice flows down like a mighty river and so forth because everything else is swept aside and it is the text that stands out in Isaiah and Amos and so forth. Yeah, thinking about this, the sins, the outward sins of the preacher being a scandalone to see, to test you, to judge whether you're able to hear what is being preached, this is exactly what is used to prepare us as readers for the crucifixion. When you see the crucifixion, outwardly, he's a sinner among the worst of sinners. What is outwardly a sin in your eyes? Is that a sin? You can't judge. Jesus was up there on the cross next to someone who was convicted as a thief. So to the passerby, what is the difference between the guy with the King of the Jews sign on top of him and the thief who is next to him? What is the difference? There is no difference. Right. To the eye, there is no difference. But to one who knows the word, there is a difference. And this is what happened in Luke. That was the discussion between the two thieves. You're just as bad as us. Mm -hmm. The one thief says, mm -hmm. well, how can you be so great? Uh -huh. You're up here on the cross with us. And the other one says, but he didn't do anything. He is innocent. We're guilty. So the first thief was willing to condemn Jesus by association with himself, whereas the second one denied it because he put himself as worse than Jesus because he says, I'm getting my just punishment. Jesus is innocent. And this is the difference between the two thieves. Are you looking at the teacher and saying, you're no better than me? Or... Are you one on the other side saying, you're innocent, I'm the guilty one? If you're the student of Torah correctly, you say, I'm getting what I deserve. Yes, and this is the point. This is what Paul's getting at. Who are you, O oh man, whoever you are, wherever you are, when you condemn another because you yourself are doing the same things? The point being that scripture is apocalyptic. It's meant to show you what it already knows about the human condition. That's the key. It's not about what you're doing, Richard, or what you're doing, Father Mark. It's about the human condition. It systematically, universally exposes so that everyone who hears it is caused to stumble, so that they would be put in the position of humility of the wise thief 
who refused to condemn Jesus and who saw the worst in himself and not in his neighbor. That's the key. It's just a correct attitude to have in life. Right. Matthew 23, if you're a student, you have no right to judge the teacher. You must listen to the teaching. If you're a teacher, you must become a student of the teaching. Exactly. Fantastic. Excellent. Thank Thank you very much. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening.